Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. Uh, my name is Jessica. I am the Planetarium director, and with me today I have our usual voice in the sky of Eli. And I'll Hello. let him introduce himself. I'm Eli. I am a physics and astronomy student at UMD. So Eli is going to be watching the uh, comments for me um, and letting me know if any questions you may have throughout the show. Um, so if you do have any, uh, type them in the comments uh, and we will get to them once we can see them. Um, just remember there is a bit of a delay between when we might answer your question and when you're going to hear it. And if for some reason we don't get to it right away, we will take some time at the end of the show to answer any questions that we missed. So for today, we're going to be talking all about telescopes. Um, and so let me get my presentation up real quick. Um, and so yeah, today is all about um, telescopes. And we know that uh, a lot of people are interested in looking through a telescope, buying a telescope, but there can be a lot of overwhelming information out there between brands and types and all sorts of fancy features um, that people just don't know where to start or what's worth the money. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to do for you today. And so before we get to our recommendations, um, the first thing I want to do is give you information, some general information on telescopes so that you can understand what all of these different types are that you're seeing and know some of the pros and cons of them. And so we're going to start off with telescope types themselves. They come in three main types. So um, the very first type of telescope that was ever made was a refracting telescope. Um, despite a common, um, it's a common misconception that Galileo invented this type of telescope. He did not. It was invented by a lens maker named Hans Libershey in 1608. But Galileo heard of the designs and then created his own. Um, but these use lenses, just like a pair of glasses, um, use lenses to gather light and focus it onto either your eye or camera or whatever you want to use. Um, and so, as I said, these were the very first telescopes made. Um, but as we got better at building and making bigger and bigger lenses, um, bigger and bigger telescopes were made. Uh, but there comes a limit to how big of a lens you can make. And so we started seeing um, problems with we wanted bigger telescopes but couldn't make a lens any bigger. There are also some issues that lenses have because they bend different colors of light by different amounts. And you can see that here. And so when you look at an object through a refracting telescope, the colors aren't always in the same place. You can see here how the red shows up in a slightly different place than the blue. And this is what we call chromatic aberration. Um, and to correct this, you end up getting a very expensive set of lenses to kind of correct for this. And so these types of telescopes can become very, very expensive depending on how big it is and how fancy the lens system is to try and correct for this kind of color offset that we see in them. So another type of telescope um, that I think are bit more common are reflecting telescopes. Um, these were actually invented by Isaac Newton, and they use a mirror instead of a lens to gather and focus the light. Um, and so the kind of easy way usually to tell the difference between the two is refracting telescopes tend to be the long skinny tubes, and reflecting telescopes tend to be kind of shorter and wider. But the benefit, of course, is we can build much bigger mirrors than we can build lenses. And so this allows us to make bigger and better telescopes um, with a mirror. Now, they have their downsides, too. Um, but most of that comes when you're trying to look at a star that's maybe hitting over here at the edge of the mirror instead of the light coming straight at the center. And that's usually not a problem because when you're looking at something, you're going to center it. And so you're not going to see those issues. Um, so yeah, that's the reflecting. 
And then the third type is a combination of the two. It's a compound or a catadioptric telescope. And this uses both a mirror and a lens. And the um, idea behind these two is by combining the two together, you get the best of both worlds. And so you can get a telescope that looks really crisp, clear. You don't have that color offset um, because that's corrected for. Um, you don't have the issues that the mirror has for starlight hitting towards the edge. But of course, since you have both, these tend to be expensive because you're paying for both a mirror and a lens. Um, so those are your three main types, refractor, reflector, and compound. Um, of the three, and we're going to get into more into this in a bit, um, the best kind of beginner telescope would definitely be a reflecting telescope uh, because you can get them kind of bigger for cheaper than you can get either of these other two types. But that's not where the choices end. Um, not only will you see options for the type of telescope, but you can see, also see options for the telescope mount, what it actually sits on. Um, so the simplest is what we call an altitude azimuth or an alt-as mount. The basic idea is the telescope can move left, right, up, and down. It's very simple to use, very simple to maneuver. Um, and so this is the best for a beginner. You want to look for this altitude azimuth or alt-as mount because it's very, very simple, very easy to use. Um, fancier systems use what's known as an equatorial mount. And these are kind of tilted at an angle because they're meant to line up with where the North Star is. And because of that, these are incredibly finicky and difficult to set up because you have to have alignments just right. You have to make sure you're um, oriented due north, that your angle's just right. They're incredibly finicky. And so I do not recommend this for beginners or even intermediates. Um, this is definitely an advanced uh, telescope set up with this equatorial mount. But the reason um, people like these is because of the angle the telescope makes kind of an arching motion across the sky, which means you can set it to look at a star. And then as the star moves across the sky, as the Earth spins, the telescope only needs to spin on one axis. And it makes it easier to follow objects if you want to follow objects across the sky. Um, but it's not the only way to do that. And again, extremely complicated to set up, so I do not recommend these um, for beginners. Uh, now, on top of there being these two different setups for the mount, altitude, azimuth, and equatorial, you can also get some telescope mounts that are computerized, or also known as go-to mounts. And these come with a little computer inside of it. Um, and they come in either two types, either the Altaz or Equatorial, you can find them in both. But the idea is that this computer, you can set up to know your location, and therefore it creates a map of the sky in its computing system, and so it can know where objects are. And so there's a catalog of objects, and you can say, go to the planet Jupiter, and it will go there by itself, and because it's uh, computerized um, and electronic, it will also track the object automatically across the sky, which this sounds perfect, right? It sounds ideal. Um, a lot of people initially think that with this, you don't have to know where things are. Um, you can just tell the telescope to go there. Um, but we, a lot of people don't realize is there is set up to this. Because when you first set up the telescope, you have to tell it where you are, and you have to send it to a couple of known objects, like a couple of known stars, and tell it, hey, that's the star Vega over here, and then point it to another star and say, hey, that's that star. And so you actually have to be really good at navigating the night sky in order to set up this telescope. 
And so this is another thing that I would not recommend for beginners or anyone who is not comfortable navigating the night sky yourself, um, because you do have to be able to do that to get this set up. Um, they're also, of course, much more expensive because you're paying for a computer. Um, all right. So with that in mind, um, I would recommend a reflecting telescope, as I said earlier, not computerized with an altitude azimuth mount, because those are the simplest to set up, the simplest to use. You don't need to have any advanced knowledge or um, know-how in order to use them. And so with that, you're still going to have a lot of options. Telescopes come in a lot of different sizes um, and a lot of different kind of accessories that come with them. And so you still, even with that, may be overwhelmed by your options. And a lot of people um, are misled to think that what you really need to know for a telescope is its magnification. How big is it going to make things? And it turns out that's actually not the important thing when choosing a telescope, because the magnification depends on what eyepiece you're using. And I'll show you more about that in a little bit. And so the key thing with a telescope is really the aperture, the size of the mirror or lens if you're using a refracting. Um, and so what you're seeing here are some comparisons of different sized telescopes. And of course, you can see the bigger the aperture, you're collecting more light, and so things look brighter. But you're also able to see more detail in the image. And so this, of course, obviously makes you think, well, I want to go as big as possible. Bigger is better. That's what I'm seeing here. Um, but there are some other things to keep in mind. Obviously, the bigger telescope is going to be a lot more expensive. Um, but you also need to think about how is how you're going to be using it and who's going to be using it. Because if you're going to be taking these telescopes elsewhere, say to a dark site, if you live in a very well lit area, you want a telescope that you're easily going to be able to carry that's very portable. And so you need to consider things like um, uh, how easy it is to take it apart and move it, how heavy it is, how easy it is to transport it, that sort of thing. But then you also need to think about who's going to be using it, because the bigger a telescope is, generally the higher the eyepiece is above the ground. And so if you're looking at using this for a lot of little kids, you're either going to want to pick something smaller or make sure you have a stepladder that they can climb up and um, look through the telescope with. Um, the other thing is uh, just durability. Obviously, if you're going to be moving it around or having it with a lot of kids, um, you want something that has a very sturdy, heavy mount so that it doesn't get knocked around. All right. So with all of this in mind, um, I want to come straight out and say, please do not be tempted by those really, really, really cheap telescopes that you can find at um, convenience stores or on Amazon, things a lot like this, um, because ultimately you're, you're getting what you're paying for. These are very cheaply made. Um, they have very wobbly mounts that aren't sturdy, that are gonna knock over. Um, they honestly are very small in size. And so even though the box may trick you into saying, hey, you could see all of this amazing detail, really this would be good for looking at the moon and that's it. Um, and so I, I know it's tempting because of how cheap they are, but they're more often than not going to be frustrating and underwhelming and may end up discouraging kids from pursuing this interest because their first and maybe only experience with telescopes was frustrating. Um, so my recommendation for a good beginner telescope is a reflecting telescope on an alt as mount in particular, the style that I like to recommend is something known as a Dobsonian telescope. Um, so this has a very sturdy base um, that the telescope tube sits on. Those two can be taken apart and carried separately. They're very easy to set up and use. Um, and 
I would recommend no smaller than a four inch telescope because any smaller than that, you're going to be able to look at the moon and that's about it. Um, anything above four inches in aperture is going to be good for moon, solar system, and some other stuff as well. Um, going the other way, I wouldn't recommend bigger than an eight inch if you're going to be uh, taking it around um, because they tend to get very heavy and aren't as portable. So somewhere in the four to eight inch range. All right, um, so my recommendation, just gonna give you straight up, this is what I would recommend people to buy, um, is by the company Orion. This is the SkyQuest X-T6 Classic Dobsonian Telescope Kit. And I need to straight up say, I am in no way, the planetarium is in no way affiliated with the Orion company or any of the other companies I talk about. Um, these recommendations come from personal use. Um, so not getting any money, not getting anything from them. This is just from my personal use, what I recommend for beginners. So the reason I like this, um, it's a six inch Dobsonian, which is um, a great kind of mid ground for being able to look at a lot of stuff, but still being very easy to um, carry around and move. Um, it's not very heavy, any of that. Um, in particular, I know the Orion telescopes are of good quality. I've used them myself for many years. Um, and I like this particular telescope kit because it also comes with a bunch of useful accessories. Um, the telescope comes with a finder scope, which helps you find your targets in the sky. So it helps you align the telescope easily. It comes with an eyepiece and something called a Barlow lens that I'll talk about in a second. Um, it comes with a red flashlight, which is what you need to uh, view at night because the red light doesn't disrupt your night vision. And so you can see without ruining that dark adapted night vision that you've acquired by being out in the dark. Um, and this kit also comes with some guides. It comes with a star chart to help you navigate the sky, um, a map of the moon to point out kind of interesting features you could look at, and then a telescope guide to help you find interesting things to see in the sky. Um, so this, this is my number one recommendation for people. Um, now, there are a lot of other good telescope brands out there. Um, I personally haven't used Aperture or Skywatcher, but from people that I know are reliable, they have said that they also make really good Dobsonian telescopes. Um, so those are two other brands that you could look at. Um, and then a little bit later on, if you're interested in one of those computerized, then Mead and Celestron make fantastic computerized telescopes, great quality. If I can say, I also have a Celestron Newtonian reflector, and it's really nice. So I really like it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these these are very reliable brands. But again, um, they some of them do fall prey to trying to give you some very cheap options. Um, and so, like, I know Orion has some telescopes that are under a hundred, but those are those two inch reflectors that or refractors that while good quality, better quality than you'd get from say a um, convenience store uh, off brands telescope, um, the really small size still only makes it good for the moon. Um, so if you want to be able to look at more than just the moon, do look at something at least four inches in size. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that is my recommendation for a telescope um, and for what to get. Um, do we have any questions about that, Eli, before I move on to the last bit? Uh, nope, no questions. No? All right. So the next thing a lot of people have questions on usually is, well, I have a telescope. What do I do now? Um, and so I want to walk you through some of the very first steps that you're going to have to take when you first get your telescope. Um, now, the SkyQuest, um, the Orion SkyQuest X-T6 that I recommend um, does come with a little bit of assembly required. Um, the main telescope tube itself is all put together. You just have to put together a couple of pieces to make the base, the mount, and you have to put like the finder scope on 
the telescope. Um, so it's very minimal. They have great instructions that will walk you through what you need to do. But it is good to be aware that there is a little bit of assembly required. Um, now, your telescope should also come with a finder scope. If it doesn't, don't buy it. Um, and these finder scopes are great because they help you align your telescope on whatever target is you're looking at. But the very first time you use your telescope, you're going to have to align your finder scope so that wherever you point your finder scope, your telescope is looking there too. And again, the instructions for the telescope will tell you exactly how to do this. The general idea is you want to look at a land based object like a telephone pole or a tree in the distance um, and center it up in the eyepiece of the telescope. And then there are some knobs on the finder scope that you'll just adjust because um, there's a little target inside the finder scope. You just adjust those knobs until the finder scope target is centered there too. And that way from then on you know that when you're centered on your finder scope your telescope is also centered there. And so it's another thing that people don't always um, know that you have to do right away. Um, this is probably the, I will say the trickiest part of setting up the telescope. I don't think it's very difficult, um, but if you are having trouble, feel free to reach out to us at the planetarium. Um, we can always help you get this sort of stuff set up. Um, so once you have those two initial steps done, then your telescope is ready to use. Um, so you're going to need to locate your target in the sky, whether it's the moon, a planet, something else. Um, and that's where things like the star charts come in handy or the phone apps um, that we've talked about in previous um, streams uh, that use your GPS and so you can hold it up and know what you're looking at. Um, and so that sort of stuff will help you kind of learn where things are in the sky. And so pick a target, say like the planet Jupiter. Then with your finder scope, the little target, you move the telescope so that Jupiter is right in the center of the target of your finder scope. Um, it may be a crosshair target, it may be a little laser dot like you're seeing here. But once that's done, you can then look in your telescope and you will see the object. Now, it may be blurry because you may need to adjust the focus. And that, I'm sorry, my cat is now sitting on my uh, keyboard. I'm having, okay. Um, <laughs> This there's a, will be a little knob and that will allow you to kind of adjust the focus so that it becomes nice and clear. Um, and yeah, that's that's the very simple step by step guide for how you do it. Um, now, a lot of people, of course, are going to want to zoom in and see detail. And unlike a camera, you can't just zoom in with a telescope um, the way you adjust the zoom or the magnification is by changing the eyepieces. Um, and so this is where um, it's usually good to have one or two, or at least about two eyepieces. Most telescopes will come with at least one. Um, the kit that I recommend comes with one eyepiece and what's known as a Barlow lens. And that essentially doubles your magnification. Um, so it's essentially the same as having two eyepieces. Um, but you can use that for any eyepiece and double its magnification. Um, but there are some things to keep in mind. <laughs> um, as with everything, when you zoom in or you magnify the image in the telescope even more, it's going to actually be dimmer than it was before. Um, and so it's gonna appear dimmer. There's also a limit to how much you can zoom in or magnify um, and still have an in-focus picture. Um, so you can see with like the picture of Saturn there, we can keep zooming in, but due to limitations of the telescope size, there's only so far you can zoom in or magnify and have a clear, crisp image and be able to focus. Um, so there's limits there just to keep in mind. Um, so yeah. With that in mind, um, really, really good targets for your initial kind of learning to use the telescope are things that you can see with your naked eye. 
so that you can easily find them. So it'd be like the moon, um, the visible planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, um, any visible comets. Um, and then once you're comfortable navigating the sky and using star charts, you can start trying to find some other things um, like galaxies or clusters or nebulae. Um, and the reason I don't recommend these right away is because you can't see most of these with your naked eye. And so you have to be able to learn how to read a star chart and learn where to look as far as like using star charts to know, okay, I want to look like halfway between these two stars to find what I'm looking for. Um, it's just kind of a, a step up, a slightly more intermediate level targets. Um, so start with things that you can see with your naked eye, get comfortable using your telescope and navigating the sky, and then you can step your way up to some other really cool objects. Um, and as long as you have at least a four inch telescope, you'll be able to see um, a lot of these things in it. So um, that's my spiel on uh, telescopes. Um, the Information for the specific telescope that I recommend is in the comments or is in the description for the video um, with a link to that. I also have links to um, those useful tools for helping you navigate the sky and that sort of stuff as well. Um, and as always, if you're in the future ever having questions, you can, you know, send us a message, send us an email, um, come to a show whenever we can open back up again, and we will gladly help you out. Um, so, do we have any questions? Uh, nope. No? Mm -mm. All right. Well, if you do have any, um, I'll give you a few minutes um, to write them in the comments. And while we wait for that, um, just a little info on what's going to be coming up in the next week. Um, so, uh, next week on Wednesday, we're doing a tour of the solar system which is always a lot of fun. And then on Saturday, we're doing a um, program that we're calling Furry Physics, which is all about the physics in the animal kingdom. So things like how animals can navigate around, um, how insects can walk on water, that sort of stuff. Um, and due to a um, recent poll that we had up on our Facebook, um, we are going to be switching to evening shows um, the week after next. We'll be moving from, instead of having Wednesdays and Saturdays at 1 p.m., it'll be Wednesdays and Saturdays at 7 p.m. That way people could go out and enjoy the day and then come back in before bedtime and uh, hang out with us for a little bit. Um, and there will be information, all of that will get posted um, and announcements on our website and on our Facebook page. Um, so, anything come in? Uh, no. No? All right. Well, as always, these um, are archived on our YouTube channel, so you can always go back and rewatch it for um, any information um, that you may want again or any past shows that you missed and want to see. Um, so with that, I guess we will wrap it up. Um, it looks to be a beautiful day, so um, enjoy and have a great weekend, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Bye.